manages her finances. She's got savings accounts where she's putting four cents a day into a club. She's got cash that she stores uh, in a little box uh, Safeway uh, in, in the mud buried. She's got nine different loans from families and friends, Some only a couple of which bear interest. She's got credit from six stores. She's lent money to neighbors. She's got somebody who's holding money for her. She's got one loan from a microcredit organization, and she's used to have an insurance policy. But what's really interesting about this is the richness of the financial life, right? There's an awful lot that Sultana has to do to just accomplish her life's goals, right? But I think you could probably imagine from just looking at this that there must be a better way, right? I mean, is this a great way to do things? When, you know, you lend money to your neighbor and need it back because your son's got to go to the doctor, the neighbor doesn't necessarily have the money when you need it. In Marguerite's example, cutting the year off the cow, you know, the way in which you store money doesn't necessarily help when you need it most, right? Or you have to sell something at a quick discount fire sale to get the money that you need to do something, right? And so these are the richness on the one hand of the way people manage their financial lives, but it has a huge cost, right? This is really inefficient. It's um, not certain, it's not efficient, it's costly. There are a lot of problems with managing your financial lives this way. So the question is, is there a way to help a family like Sultana's accomplish its life goals with a variety of formal banking services that improve on the way she's working now and help her achieve those goals we all share from a developmental perspective. When you try and help Sultana, you run into the most fundamental reality of all, right? Which has been the challenge we have been fighting for how many years? 30 years, Michael? Marguerite, it's been 30 or 40 years that we've been trying to figure out how to help Sultana, right? We have been saying, you know, there must be a better way. You know, on average, the way Sultana saves money loses 20% a year, according to studies. Okay? Saving in animals, saving in gold, the bricks get stolen, all the ways in which she saves actually degrades in value on average 20% a year. There must be a better way, right? Here's the problem. The problem is that it's really costly to help Sultana from our perspective, talking from the perspective of organizations that try to be helpful, and it's expensive from Sultana's perspective. Do you know that every time you stand in a cashier's window at a bank around the world globally, it costs about a dollar to that bank, right? It's kind of a lot. So if I'm Sultana living on 32 cents a day, you know, you can imagine the bank isn't all that interested in having me stand there in the window with my 10 cents. Could it cost them a dollar? But you know what's even more fundamental? Even more fundamental is there aren't very many banks where Sultana lives. For Sultana to get to a bank or a branch, Sultana's got to get on a motor rickshaw, or maybe even a, a, a uh, one that's being propelled manually, pay some fee, maybe 10 cents on a dollar, maybe 30 cents on a dollar in Nairobi slums, which Marguerite's going to talk about later. It's 50 cents on a dollar to get to the bank, to wait in line, to be treated not so well, because she might only have so, not so much money, and then turn around and do it all on the way back. So it might be, maybe cost her a dollar or two to interact with a financial institution. That's our problem, right? Costs them a lot of money to interact with what the formal financial system has been up till now, and it costs us a lot of money to, to have clients like that. That's been the fundamental challenge of microfinance for these 30 or 40 years. And so what Marguerite and Michael are going to talk about is, is how institutions have been addressing how they've been building uh, portfolios of clients where they're attacking some of these fundamental ways uh, uh, to be successful against this really core problem, right? And then when we talk about the future, which I think we'll do uh, after we've done our initial round, we're going to try and mention some of the exciting 
new advances we think might help us achieve a whole new step change in our ability to reach clients uh, profitably. I think that's a point that will be made and on a much uh, greater scale. So that's it for me. I think Michael, you're up. Thanks. It's a great pleasure to be here with you talking about something that all three of us care deeply about. And it's an even greater pleasure to do it with Marguerite and Bob, in which we have been in many trenches uh, many times. <laughs> As Bob said, you know, the problem here is how do you get financial services to people that are very badly served? And in the world, when you look at who gets better served, it's always the 2.4 that are at the top of the pyramid. And that's most of the states, Western Europe, and the top of the pyramid of emerging markets, in which we basically more or less live the same. But if you look at the rest, and the rest is important because actually, as the Office of International Labor has estimated in Geneva, 70% plus of the people that are economically active in the world earn whatever they earn in the informal sectors. And what we're talking about is how does financial services get to those informal sectors, which is microfinance. Well, as Bob was referring to, it is really an industry that has been four decades in the making. In the early 70s, there was a period of great experimentation. And it was taking place in Indonesia, Bank Dagan Bali, in the 1970s. A tailor started experimenting with savings and loans. There was also uh, uh, nonprofits in Colombia, Opportunity International in 71, issued some microfinance loans, Axion, institution that I've been involved with for a long time, uh, issued its first loan in 1973 in Recife, poor part of Brazil. In 1976, a professor was lending money to people outside the university in Grameen, that became Grameen Bank. All individual efforts, none correlated. Nobody ever thought that it was the start of an industry. And this period of experimentation in the 70s was precisely trying to get at what Bob was saying. How do you do it in a way that can actually meet its costs when you're trying to serve people that are so poor. And that led to the 80s, in which something fundamental happened. The most interesting institutions out there in the middle of the 1980s deployed methodologies that were all trial and error. But they accomplished something fundamental in the middle of the 80s. They achieved break even. That meant that what they charged was enough to meet all the costs that re it was required to take the service to the poor and make a profit. Why was that? Well, one of the reasons is because actually resources, where it's so capitally constrained, is very expensive. So actually, if you look at what a money lender will lend as I've had this conversation thousands of times. I was talking to a woman in an open street market in Lima one, one day. She, was, she sold shirts. And I said to her, uh, and she was receiving shirts. Uh, and I said, do you, do you borrow Doña Maria? She said, yes. Difficult? No, no. It's from Don Pepe, two blocks down. Knows me from all my life. I need something, I go and borrow. So I said, how much did you borrow? He said, I borrowed what was the equivalent of something like $20. What do you pay back? I said, oh, a couple of days. How much do you pay them back? It's not very much, $2. So it takes $2 to rent $20 for two days. If you take out your financial calculator, you'll find that that is in the four digits, if not five. It's thousands percent. So I said to her, why borrow? 
do you need to borrow? I said, oh, of course. If I don't take these shirts, I have to take three buses to get to the central market, spend three, four hours selecting shirts, take three buses to come back, and actually, I've lost the whole day. And so that's why microfinance works when you borrow from the money bank. It's that the interest rate, although it's huge, first of all, it's short. You don't let it accumulate. Second, it's the opportunity cost. It's the whole transaction cost that is at issue. So the interest rate, actually, for that woman that would have lost the whole day is actually a very small part of her whole transaction cost. <coughs> and of course, then, it's the opportunity cost. She wouldn't have had shirts to sell and therefore no food to bring to her table at the end of the day. Well, when break-even was reached, it was fantastic because actually the source of funds for that first stage in the 70s was philanthropy and developmental agencies. But when break-even was achieved, the growth was so fast that you couldn't do it with the source of funds of philanthropy or developmental agencies. So actually, the first initiatives were made to link uh, uh, my financial institutions or, or nonprofits that were out there with the banking sector because that's where the money was. So microfinance institutions started to borrow from banks. But actually growth was so large, so high, that the banking sector wasn't enough to lend on an unsecured basis because, of course, a microfinance institution doesn't have more than the IOUs of the poor as its asset. So actually then, the next stage came in the 90s, in which the next step was to say, if we have a methodology that can lend and recover and cover its costs, then we should actually become regulated financial institutions, i.e. banks, ourselves. And that was the beginning of institutions like Banco Sol in Bolivia in 92, Mi Banco in Peru in 98, Compartamos Banco in 2000. Where are we today with all this development behind us? Well, today, one way to look at the state of the art is that in the decade of the 2000s, we had these institutions serving nobody but the low-income sectors that had become sufficiently profitable to actually offer their shares in the stock exchange of their countries. The first was Bank Rakyat of Indonesia, the microfinance giant in 2003, 2006 Equity Bank, which Marguerite will talk more about. And then there were these institutions have do other things other than microfinance. But then there were some institutions that did nothing but microfinance that also went and issued shares in public markets. Compartamos Banco in 2007 and in 2010 SKS in India. So these are now institutions that trade in the stock exchange that do nothing but serve the financial needs of the poor. Industry scale. This is what defines scale today. You have institutions that reach hundreds, not only hundreds of thousands of people, you're talking about institutions that reach millions of people. And the loans out in the street are in the billions. And you also have an industry that has been built to serve the microfinance industry. So actually today, some people estimate that there's a billion dollars from investors trying to invest in microfinance in the form of debt and equity. So in fact, after four decades of growth, funding is actually not the constraint. And when you look at, uh, however, after all these accomplishments that I've told you, we're actually at the beginning. Because you can do a lot of approximations, and Marguerite will share with you some <coughs> estimates as well. I don't think that overall, you're reaching more than 150 million active clients, just in terms of basic credit. And the portfolio out there is probably somewhere around $50 billion. That's a lot when you remember, like all three of us do, when it was nothing. But actually, there's a lot of road to go. Because you could estimate that there's at least 600 million families in the world that would benefit from microfinance. And here, let me make one aside. 
not everybody benefits from microfinance. So if you're poor and you get access to microfinance and your assets don't grow, you may be in the worse pickle than before. So actually, the good institutions select who they provide financial services, just like all of us. <coughs> some of us do great with credit, and some of us do very badly with credit, or savings, or any of the other financial services. <coughs> but So you can make an estimate that I think today, where the penetration is still like 25% or 20% of where we ought to be if we serviced everybody that could benefit from receiving it. And I, uh, uh, let me skip that because Marguerite was going to talk a lot more about that. Uh, today, an industry that has changed very rapidly in those four decades continues changing very fast. It continues changing so fast that actually I think all the key success factors that were responsible for the great institutions of the past are actually all those factors are in flux. In the first place, there's heightened competition. One example is that in Peru, of 55 institutions regulated by the superintendency of banks, 44 are engaged in microfinance. Uh, there are new players that have come in from uh, uh, non-banking origins, like retail chains that provide services to the base of permit. There's a very developed microfinance ecosystem today. And there's a globalization process that is going on even in microfinance. And there's the influx of technology just like everywhere else. And so there are massive changes that are happening at the front office and at the back office of uh, microfinance. And I think the promise of that, of all those changes, is that competition and technology together, I think, are finally going to solve the microfinance paradox. The paradox is that in banking, high-touch banking only happens at the very top and at the very bottom. Private banking is for the millionaires and for the base of payment, because up to now, it's been high-touch banking. And I think we're going to evolve to, to low-touch banking. And that is going to allow us to go from today's 150 million to tomorrow's 600 million. And so tomorrow, we're going to see models that disrupt what has become the establishment of microfinance today. And the holy grail for me is to go from high touch to no touch. But the future is also full of threats. Because today's visibility of microfinance is, has all been the result of the success of commercial microfinance. And when that happens, you see, the large institutions that are responsible for much of the reach of microfinance are for-profit institutions that are regulated by the supremacy of banks. And therefore, you have a situation in which you're deriving profit, and sometimes very good profit, from serving the poor. And that is a combustible political mix. Government oversight is unavoidable, whether we like it or not. And some of us think that actually regulation is absolutely essential when you're looking at market mechanisms to address the needs of the poor. Because markets without regulation is the jungle. And the jungle, the predator king, the biggest predator is the king. And we know that. We know that because we've seen what happened when Soviet Russia has become the Russia of today. So regulation is absolutely necessary. But the key question then is, what is smart regulation and what is dumb regulation? And the threat is absolutely real, because those of you who are involved with microfinance will know that we, are, we have gone through, in the last couple of years, a deep crisis in the state of Andhra Pradesh in India that threatens, in my view, to take microfinance back a decade or more in India. Because at the heart of the issue there is what is the role of profits and social impact at the base of the pit. And with that, let me pass it on to Marguerite.